Good evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody, also to participate to this uh, webinar co-organized by EHG and by Ipsum. I'm Thierry Ponchon from Lyon University from France, and I have a pleasure to co-chair this session with Evgeny Fedorov. Evgeny is, of course, a famous endoscopist from Russia. He's working in the Pirogov uh, Medical University in Moscow. Welcome, Evgeny. Thank you very much, Thierry. And um, of course, even during pandemia, we should continue to perform colonoscopy because we still have a lot of patients with polyps and colorectal cancer, unfortunately. And I think this is the period we should have perfect bowel cleansing because we need to avoid to repeat examination. So that's why tonight we will see the role of bowel cleansing concerning diagnosis, difficult diagnosis, concerning surveillance, and also how bowel cleansing is important when you have, unfortunately, a perforation. So we have three lectures, of course, with Evgeny, with Yaroslav Regula, and with Klaus Monkemüller. So I hope you will enjoy this webinar. I want again to thank Ibsen, because of course, as you know, Ibsen is producing, of course, some bowel cleansing preparation. So I, I want first to tell you that you should uh, interfere you should intervene. It should be interactive. And for this, you have to use the chat or the Q&A. So please be ready to intervene. Now, I will ask Evgeny to give the first lecture. And Evgeny will speak about importance of overall preparation in difficult diagnostic and therapeutic situations. Evgeny? Thank you very much, Thierry. Uh, well, uh, importance of power preparation in difficult diagnostic and therapeutic uh, situations is uh, more or less an introductory lecture. And uh, at the beginning, I would like to say that in difficult diagnostic and therapeutic situations, there are no secondary links. And of course, along with the other links, preparation is very important role in uh, our uh, speciality. Talking about uh, difficult, not cases, but patients in colonoscopy, I would like to say that absolutely unprepared colon, perhaps the most difficult case in colonoscopy, but not the topic of our symposium today, while sometimes we have very strange and uh, funny sometimes claims, for example, like this one, in preparation for my colonoscopy, including this night, I use foods, apples, prunes, and beets that promote good bowel movements. Why do you refuse my colonoscopy and make me prepare again? Or another, I followed all the preparation instructions that I found on the internet and drank four four large packets yesterday and today. Why did you decide that I was not ready for the colonoscopy and not performing? I will write a complaint about you to the health department. Sometimes it happens. Well, uh, let me shortly explain the difficult diagnostic and therapeutic situations. First of all, difficult colon itself. Difficult to reach in the second with the recommended minimum insufflation due to a poorly prepared colon. Everyone knows how it's difficult to penetrate through the unprepared colon. Difficulty detecting lesions with elective colonoscopy in a poorly prepared colon. And Yaroslav will explain us in details. Difficult diagnosis during an emergency colonoscopy, when there is not enough time for preparation or when the preparation is dangerous or contraindicated. Adverse events in colonoscopies due inappropriate colon preparation itself and adverse events during diagnostic and therapeutic colonoscopies, where the further treatment and outcomes depend on the quality of bowel preparation. <laughs> Difficult colon. Be prepared to get to a certain place. Of course, if you have such a uh, colon, it's very difficult to reach the cecum, especially in complicated cases, adhesions, diverticula, and so on. While, uh, as Shinekuda said in 1996, bowel preparation plays a key role in the examination of the large intestine along with insertion technique 
and observation. And the quality of examination results depends on bowel preparation. And 2012, good bowel preparation allows the detection of neoplasia and optimizes cycle intubation. Here you can see uh, preparation on drugs. And of course, you have two opportunities. You can spend a lot of time to thoroughly wash and clean the right side of the colon or uh, to schedule colonoscopy for the next time. But uh, if you share, uh, postpone the uh, colonoscopy, you can easily, of course, miss this uh, sessile serrated lesion, which you will see just in, in a moment in the second. What effort should the endoscopist put in cleaning the unprepared colon during colonoscopy? It also depends from the clinical situation. Any emergency, like in this case of bleeding, active bleeding, obstructive tumor, sigmoid volvulus, which could, could uh, protect the preparation. And uh, finally, you have to answer, is it possible at all to prepare the colon? If yes, how <laughs> intensive, how long, and would it be reimbursed? Difficulty detecting lesions with elective colonoscopy. Maybe uh, chromoendoscopy is becoming a thing of the past with the arrival of artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence is not yet able to see through these opaque contents. However, uh, my question, is it so? Uh, after all, the endoscope has already learned to see the vessel through the blood, you know, this new generation from uh, Olympus company. And even in a case of uh, difficulty detecting lesion, not only small one, but the huge one, advanced adenomas or advanced cancer, uh, we can easily miss with the bad preparation. Difficulty uh, detecting lesions uh, also uh, in case of multiply primary synchronous colon cancer with prolonged course of ulcerative colitis. While well, you have to check all the colon to make the right decision about the length of prepared colon and to get the right diagnosis. Difficult diagnosis during emergency colonoscopy. Uh, on the left side, we, you can see the lipoma of the ileum with the intersusception into the ascendant colon. While on the right side, uh, at the beginning, we do not understand what, what, what we are really uh, found, found out, like a submucosal tumor, or we think about intersusception, and uh, only after careful uh, preparation, we find also ulceration, erosions, and uh, this, uh, it was not the intersusception from the ileum. And in case when difficult diagnosis during the emergency colonoscopy, when it's not enough time for preparation, or when it's dangerous and contraindicated in case of severe ulcerative colitis on the left side or ischemic uh, colitis on the right side of of uh, video. And of course, uh, the right diagnosis uh, influenced the right decision uh, making and treatment making. Also, uh, we sometimes know uh, in the last years, fortunately, uh, less and less, but we still have some uh, reports about gas explosion and explosive uh, adverse events from colonoscopy are rare but have serious consequences, consequences like a colonic perforation and even death. And gas explosion can occur when combustible levels of hydrogen or methane gas are present in the colonic lumen 
oxygen is present and electrical surgical energy is used. Suspected risk factors are use of non-absorbable or incompletely absorbable carbohydrate preparations such as mannitol, lactulose, or sorbitol. And uh, also some authors have advocated use of CO2 during colonoscopy and avoiding, avoiding enema only bowel preparation before applying argon plasma coagulation for the treatment of radiation proctitis because it's another, another uh, risk factor for explosion. And uh, of course, uh, when we working with the empty well-prepared colon, even if uh, perforation is occurred, we can uh, further treatment and outcome depends on the quality of the bowel preparation. And in case when the colon is prepared, we can close it endoscopically without laparotomy or laparoscopic approach. While in case when, when it's uh, uh, perforation, the further treatment and outcome depend on the quality of the bowel preparation and colonic stool contamination, of course, lead to surgery. And Klaus will explain us in more details uh, about uh, diagnosis and treatment of uh, perforation of the colon. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Evgeny. A great presentation. Uh, I, I observe that there is one question which is a little tricky. Um, how long do you wash? For example, how you, you wash uh, 10 seconds, you wash one minute, you wash five minutes, after, at the end you stop. Uh, when do you stop to wash? Actually, uh, Thierry, it's a very good question. At the very beginning, I have to decide would it be possible uh, in general to prepare the colon? Uh, of course, if it's completely unprepared, solid stool, we just postpone uh, colonoscopy. But if we decide to prepare the colon, we spend uh, time uh, which is necessary to remove all the debris and bubbles and to be confident with the uh, uh, mucosa not to, uh, not to uh, miss, uh, is, is, uh, not to miss uh, important lesions. That is my answer. Okay, so um, I observe that we are more or less uh, 550 hmm, altogether. So it's a, it's a great audience. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, maybe uh, there, there was a, there was a slide. Uh, me, maybe it was probably difficult uh, to, to read the, this slide because uh, because of we are short of time. But concerning concerning hematochesia, when when you have a bleeding, how do you prepare the patient? Can you repeat it? Do you prepare it or, or personally, I don't always prepare a patient in this case, but please explain us what you are doing. You know, um, at the last years, we have to follow the uh, guidelines of the European society. We now prepare the guidelines for uh, lower GI bleeding and, and other societies where the it's recommended to prepare the colon using the large volume of polyethylene glycol, sometimes uh, via the tube. So we try to do this. Of course, in case, uh, for example, if we suspect uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, especially so-called fulminant or severe case, we do not prepare the colon. Or if, for example, we now know that uh, uh, we have got the bleeding from the rectum or rectosigmoid after, uh, after polypectomy. We do not prepare all the colon. We can go straight ahead. But speaking generally, we try to prepare with the a large amount of polyethylene glycol, four to six liters. Okay. Um, artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I was interested by your, your, your 
small speech or your okay what you spoke about uh, really is there a relationship between the quality of a preparation and, and the efficacy of the result of artificial intelligence is there a, a, a proof relationship so far or not yes as maybe far as i know from the... intelligence we don't need a so good bowel cleansing maybe i don't think so Thierry, because <laughs> We discussed several times that artificial intelligence uh, can uh, can pick up uh, what uh, what <laughs> what you show to to the artificial intelligence. That's why it's the same if uh, you are not looking to the behind the, the faults. Uh, artificial intelligence will never uh, say you about the uh, small tiny lesions on the behind the. It's the same with the probably in the future. Why is it so? Because uh, when I for the first time saw the blood vessel through the real uh, blood flow, uh, probably in the future we can also find out the way to look through the uh, fecal material, but not at the moment. So at the moment we have to prepare the call. Um, one or two other questions. Uh, in fact, uh, th there was a question concerning the, the, the regimen you should take before colonoscopy. You mean what diet. kind? Of, what kind of regimen you mean? Yes, diet, not diet, uh, uh, fiber, etc., really? etc. Et How long? Uh, normally, no fiber diet. Normally, we uh, we follow the three days of, uh, uh, of uh, diet, I mean, low residual diet, and uh, split dose, of course, evening and morning, or in the last uh, time, uh, or last months, uh, for colonoscopy scheduled for the second part of the day, we sometimes uh, uh, prepare also in split uh, mode, but, during the morning time, not okay. not evening morning, but morning morning. Um, there is a question about uh, the, the, the quality of a burial cleansing and the surveillance, but we have this uh, to There is a question about bleeding. In case of bleeding following a therapeutic procedure within the first 44 hours, usually it is not necessary to prepare a burial, even if the bleeding is in the right plan. Do you agree? Sorry, Thierry, I do not uh, hear you very well. Probably I can look through. It's the question from the chat or from question and answers? From, from the chat. Let the last question from the chat. In case, of, in case of bleeding following a therapeutic procedure, within the first 24 hours, usually it is not necessary to prepare the bowel even if the bleeding is in the right colon. Do you agree? Uh, you know, yes, if patient uh, do not, uh, I mean, uh, if, if the colon is still empty and the patient was not eating uh, extensively after the therapeutic procedure, yes, it would be possible to go. I think so. I think so. Yeah. I think I, so. Evgeny, I, thank you very much. Maybe you should introduce Yaroslav. Of course, it's my pleasure to introduce Yaroslav, our colleague and our friend from Poland, from uh, Warsaw or Warsaw in, <laughs> in our language. And he is working in Maria Skladowska Curie National Oncological Center uh, Research Institution, Chief of Gastroenterology. And uh, he will prepare yourself. He will present very uh, interesting and provocative uh, lecture. Please, Yaroslav. Good evening, everybody, uh, to all five, more than 500 attendees. Thank you very much for your attention. I will speak about the how the bowel preparation influences our diagnostic uh, diagnosis and uh, uh, surveillance recommendations. So, so this is the topic. Um, let me start with the video uh, where you have a very nicely cleaned colon. There should be no problem to find uh, the lesions, and there is a one very discreet lesion over here, probably some of you have already noticed. Uh, yes, on this fold. And uh, 
with the arctic colon of course it would be very difficult to find it uh, but with the clean, clean colon it is difficult but uh, but possible so the clean colon is extremely of course important um, the next video shows um, this is the removal of this lesion and the uh, next video shows the process of cleaning and sucking and i want to show you how it looks it's very laborious it takes quite a lot of time sometimes, but it's worth uh, doing. In cases, as uh, Evgeny said, it is uh, possible to clean, we think it is possible. Now you see that you need to look into all the pools of the liquid, of the water that was just instilled, suck it and trying to clean as clean as possible uh, using the water, the stream of water. And now um, you can, uh, be successful. Here you can on the right side, you can see the lesion uh, more, more easily visible on the NBI and uh, uh, without uh, cleaning, probably you will not be able to see. So this cleaning is very important. Of course, during our practice, we need to assess what was our uh, bowel preparation. The most frequently used bowel pre preparation scales are the three ones that, that are underlined. So Boston Bowel Preparation Scale, Arontic Scale, and U uh, US uh, Multi-Society Task Force on Corrector Cancer. I have put some stars with these three, um, uh, with these uh, scales. The two stars means that the assessment is done after washing that I have just shown you. And one star means that uh, Assessment is done before cleaning, before washing. So uh, in these cases, um, this uh, one star option is uh, used for the assessment of the uh, bowel preparation reg regimen, but in the after washing also includes the uh, activity of the endoscopies and the motivation to clean. So this is important to uh, remember these scales. Of course, the, our diagnoses are different. We can measure this diagnosis. The most frequently used uh, diagnosis um, ratings is the adenoma detection rate, but also the other ones, including serrated polyp detection rates. But also we, we have the study showing how the bowel prep can in, influence the incidence and mortality of colorectal cancer that I will show you at the end. So, um, in fact, uh, when I started to prepare that, uh, I would uh, like to say that it, it sounds obvious that the better bowel preparation, the higher diagnostic yield, what should we talk about? And it is proven in some studies. This, this one is the systematic review and meta-analysis that favors the uh, high quality bowel preparation rate, and it results in the higher adenoma detection rate. And this is quite obvious. Another study, showing that in uh, when the bowel preparation is very is poor which is the worst one in the scales the all aspects of polyp diagnosis are affected including all adenomas and vast adenomas uh, uh, polypolyte of non polypoid lesions proximal uh, lesions and so on when the bowel preparation is slightly better that is fair the firstly affected um, finding is not pol non polypoid lesion. So, with a still not adequate bowel prep, but slightly better than uh, assessed as poor, the first affected finding is non polypoid flat lesion. So, this is what is really expected. But there are some studies showing strange things that, that do not support this uh, saying the better bowel prep, the higher adenoma detection rate. And I, will, I would like to, to show you some of these uh, studies, very strange ones. One of those is the one uh, showing that the higher bowel preparation, Boston bowel preparation scale, as you see on the X axis, you see the lower adenoma detection rate. What's going on? How this study could happen that you say with such a finding? Another strange study from PLOS One uh, journal showing no difference between excellent and fair um, in adenoma detection rates or excellent and good bowel preparation. This is, I find, also strange uh, result of such a study that uh, we do not expect the obvious uh, thing that should happen. How do you explain that? 
The explanation can be found, uh, I think, in one of the uh, very important study from uh, 20, uh, from 2006 by Thomas, uh, Siwan Thomas Gibson on sigmoidoscopy uh, uh, trial showing uh, this probably explanation. Overall adenoma detection rate, so the left uh, red uh, um, uh, uh, finding is sh showing rating of endoscopies according to adenoma detection rate from 15.9 to 8.6. On the right side, you can see the ranking based on that, how frequently the endoscopies, the same endoscopies rated the bowel preparation rate as excellent and good. As you can see now, the endoscopist with the highest adenoma detection rate is rated 13 on the rank in the, in the ranking of most frequent excellent bowel preparation. On the other hand, someone with uh, adenoma detection rate 9.1, very low one, is number one in uh, competition for uh, most frequent ranking uh, excellent or good bowel preparation rate. So this is probably the explanation confirmed also in, the, in this study by saying that those with high adenoma detection rate, when the, their uh, video is assessed by independent video scorer, are usually assessed at the, by video scorers that bowel prep should be assessed better than by the endoscopist. So the conclusion from this older study explaining in irregular, irregularities in the previous studies is that endoscopists with the highest adenoma detection rate rarely are satisfied with the bowel preparation. So the less frequently rate bowel, they, they less frequently rate bowel preparation as excellent and good than lower adenoma detection rate. So this, is, this could be the explanation of these strange findings. Another uh, irregularity is that some studies are showing that good bowel preparation is better than excellent bowel preparation. As for example, in this study showing in adenoma detection rate and our diagnosis that good is, has higher value, value than excellent. How to explain that? Um, another study comparing uh, good and excellent bowel preparation uh, from Journal of Clinical Gastroenterology. Um, they defined excellent bowel preparation when there was no need for flushing and suctioning and good when there was a, a need for large amount of flushing and suctioning. So this was the main uh, difference between these um, uh, um, uh, these scales. And what they found that there was no difference in adenoma detection rate uh, between those who had excellent and good bowel preparation. So this is a strange finding again. Only when they looked at the advanced adenomas and cesarean serrated polyps, there was a um, result that we expected. So how to explain this excellent versus good enigma? Um, there are probably several explanations, but um, it is discussed in the literature that, literature that when the bowel prep is excellent, endoscopists can be demotivated for to search lesions intensively enough. So the, the, um, the, the saying can be that when you think the bowel prep is excellent, be more careful because you can think you, you see everything, but it's maybe not true. And then uh, another explanation could be that a bit of dirt may be helpful in finding some lesions. So in this case, good is better than excellent. Okay. Um, so another um, thinking about bowel preparation uh, assessment scores is that usually bowel preparation scale uses the global assessment of the whole large bowel. You are counting different segments, but in total, you give the final result um, uh, up to the uh, whole bowel. This is the study showing that you can also analyze each segment separately. This is study on 5,000 colonoscopies, which were divided by, was assessed by segments, giving uh, 15,000 segments. And when you use this segmental uh, partial uh, assessments, then you can find that everything fits okay. The better Boston Bowel Preparation Scale score, the higher uh, segmental finding. And uh, 
in the future, I think, if we want to have a perfect um, um, correlation between the um, assessment of bowel preparation uh, and, adenom and fi uh, diagnostic finding, probably we should uh, do the segmental analysis. Um, so uh, in summary, the bowel prep assessment should be done optimally by independent assessor to avoid high quality endoscopies to bias. Excellent is not always better than the good. Segmental scoring should be used to obtain precision and caution, general caution, the bowel prep preparation assessment is subjective. So what do we do when the bowel prep is not okay? Then it is of course, as we said, necessary to, um, uh, to um, repeat colonoscopy. And uh, this re early repeated endoscopy should not be yet called surveillance. This is just the part of the initial endoscopy because you have to repeat to, uh, to, to summarize those first two endoscopies altogether. And usually it's done within one year and the results of such early repeating endoscopy colonoscopies show high rate of missed lesions and um, they may change surveillance interval. If you change the finding, then you have to change the surveillance interval as, as opposed to the initial uh, endoscopy assessment. This study shows very high rate, miss rates of the early repeat colonoscopy performed within three years. And it's up to 48% uh, percent miss rate. So it's really high on those repeat colonoscopies uh, when, when uh, uh, study was a suboptimal sub was bowel preparation. And the location, it's very interesting and confirmed by, by many people, is the location of missed adenomas on repeat colonoscopy within two years is usually in the right colon, so ascending colon and transverse colon. So in these areas, you should look for very carefully to, to look for lesions, usually uh, non polypoid ones uh, that you can easily miss with a suboptimal bowel prep. And this study from last month, from November in endoscopy, shows uh, that um, if uh, you repeat uh, colonoscopy because of subtomial bowel prep, then you need to change uh, surveillance interval in about 15% of patients from 10 years initially used for the patient to three years subtomial um, uh, in, in interval after repeated colonoscopy. So this is important that um, this second uh, endoscopy was done because in other way, the surveillance interval uh, would be too long and uh, uh, we should not finish with the initial sub uh, endoscopy assessment with suboptimal sub bowel preparation, of course. So um, now the last uh, issue, how the bowel prep may influence the colorectal cancer incidence and mortality. Um, there is a study from our center um, showing, uh, comparing the high quality colonoscopy versus low quality colonoscopy uh, with 17 years follow up. Uh, it was a screen colonoscopy and um, one of three um, uh, factors that were defining high quality colonoscopy was bowel preparation. Excellent, good of sufficient, uh, altogether as uh, thought as to be adequate. So this is part of high quality uh, colonoscopy. And if you compare um, the incidence of colorectal cancer within 17 years after initial colonoscopy and compare this incidence with general uh, population uh, uh, rate, then you can see that both uh, types of colonoscopies, low quality and high quality, decrease the incidence of colorectal cancer, but the high quality colonoscopy decreases much more, much uh, higher, up to 84% the incidence of colorectal cancer uh, and significantly than the uh, low quality uh, colonoscopy. And it also applies to mortality from colorectal cancer over the period of 17 years, as compared to general population, the high quality colonoscopy decreases this mortality by 90%. So this is the important factor. Uh, one of the factors of high quality is the bowel prep. So in summary, um, the better bowel prep quality, the higher diagnostic yield, it is obvious. Even if we find some studies that are not confirming that, but then 
these conflicting results in some studies can be explained by the methodological imperfections that I have explained to you, and we should be aware of those. In other words, bowel prep enforces early repeat colonoscopy. Repeat colonoscopy may change initial surveillance recommendation. That's why it's so important. And the high quality negative colonoscopy, this, this, the last study she was showing, the results of this colonoscopy was negative, so the normal, um, decreases the colorectal cancer incidence in mortality up to seven years, uh, 17 years post colonoscopy. So I, I think the bowel prep is really crucial for, uh, for diagnosis and for surveillance. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Yaroslav, thank you so much for your academic and very well balanced lecture. Uh, we have some questions for you, if you don't mind. Of course. Uh, could you please, are there any criteria to recognize patients prone to insufficient preparation in order to suggest more intensive regimens? Well, there are several studies um, that were showing that it is uh, the, the, the probability of having a bad bowel prep uh, are existing. These are the usually uh, more obese people. These are the people uh, that are prepared in hospital, uh, that, that are people that are alone, living alone without uh, uh, someone else there in the house. Uh, people with comorbidities, with the uh, older ages. Um, and also, uh, I think uh, the people are after surgeries and so on. So th these, are, these are the group. This is not always confirmed in different studies and you can find uh, your own list in your center uh, where you really think uh, the bowel prep will be, that you can predict uh, when, when the bowel prep um, will probably be bad, yeah. Thank you very much. One more question. Do you think if adenoma detection rate requirements should be different in patients with positive uh, immunofecal uh, blood test and those who undergo colonoscopy without screening by FOBT? Yes, of course. Um, the um, uh, adenoma detection rates uh, uh, in people with positive feet have higher adenoma detection rate. There were studies comparing uh, this and this uh, this adenoma detection is usually expected to be at least 10% or 15% higher, or some say uh, it should be double than the one uh, as compared to people who were just uh, had, uh, had primary colonoscopy screening. So these, the values uh, should be adapted for fit positive people. And, and in real life, it's, it's uh, indeed uh, at least double, uh, double the value. Thank you. Probably the last question, Yaroslav, uh, very uh, practical. Do you recommend always intubate ileum in the surveillance colonoscopy? Well, it's, uh, it's a matter of discussion. Uh, we usually uh, suggest to everybody to try to, to intubate ileum just to train, to be able to, to do it easily uh, if it's necessary. Um, but it's not really obligatory in, in my view, uh, but it's a matter of discussion and it's the local uh, differences. I don't know how is that in with you or with uh, Thierry. Um, it is of course no use of trying for several minutes to intubate ileum if it's difficult because sometimes it's really difficult. So That's it's true. not a purpose. If it's not a purpose of the colonoscopy, then you don't need that uh, routinely yes. in every case. Thank you very much, Yaroslav, mm -hmm. and uh, let me pass the uh, words to Thierry. Please, Thierry. Uh, okay, so just, just I have a last question to Yaroslav. Yaroslav. Mm -hmm. I was very interested by the, the, the that you presented about uh, some paradoxes related to the bowel cleansing, okay? So do you, 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 you should avoid to be self-satisfied. Always. by the quality of cleansing and by, by the quality of examination, okay? You should avoid, you should yeah. be rigorous. And does, do you observe, does it mean in the, in, the, in the literature, is there a relationship between a psychological profile and adenoma detection rate? Psychological profile, of course, not of a patient, but of the operator. Well, um, there is a feeling that it must be like that because the people with the highest adenoma detection rates are usually the, the, the people 
with a special personality that are very strict, very well organized, and they are well motivated to do their job. And those with lower than normal detection rate, as a humans, they usually are, you know, easily distracted. They they are always in a hurry. They are they are um, not really caring. But it's of course it's not a rule. It's it's not confirmed uh, um, because uh, we tried in the past to do the study, but um, uh, it, it was thought to be not very ethical to assess the psychological um, profile of the endoscopist in view of his. Uh, medical uh, findings, but, it, but it, I have a feeling that it, it's, it should be confirmed. The personality plays a role. Okay, okay. so okay, we, we stop to discuss this point, but I have a feeling that the female, the female operator, they have a, a, the, the best, a best profile than, than us, probably. Okay, yeah, now I, I will let the floor to Klaus Monkemüller. Uh, uh, Klaus he is, of course, very, very famous, especially in South America. He's speaking fluently Spanish, of course, and uh, he, has, he has been professor of medicine in Alabama for four years, and he came back to Germany in 2016. Now he's working in Albertstadt. Klaus will speak about the relationship between bowel cleaning and, and, and perforation. How do you manage perforation, take into account the, the, the quality of the bowel cleaning? Klaus, please. Thank you very much, Thierry. These are my disclosures. So we will be talking about management of a colon perforations, but mainly on how to prevent them. And during this lecture, I will focus on seven take home messages and a lot of quick, valuable, uh, quick takes or pearls that will be useful in your practice, I hope. So we will essentially focus on a practical approach to prevent and treat colon perforations. So when we are doing a polypectomy, we need to do a careful investigation of the lesion. We need to have a clean colon, of course. We need to use all the utensils we have to delineate the lesion. We need to interrogate the lesion. We need to talk to, to the lesion. We need to have some feedback from this lesion to see what's the best way to tackle it. So this is what's happening here. And then you can see that the second aspect is to be preventive. So let's do some injection, especially the submucosal cushion. That's going to be helpful. Let's be redundant and do some more. More is better. Try to elevate the lesion. So take all the steps that are necessary to avoid a perforation. So once the submucosal cushion or interventional chromoendoscopy is performed, well, you can proceed to do the resection. In this case, it was decided to perform an, an EMR. But you will see that despite doing all of the necessary precautions, there was a perforation. But no problem, there is actually a clean colon. There is actually a good endoscopic position. The clip is coming out of the six or five o'clock position. You start always at the edge with the first clip. Don't try to close the perforations. Try to put a clip on the edge because this will elevate the other areas to finally place the remaining clip. So here we saw an ideal situation of a bad situation. So R0 resection and the colon was clean. But here, this was a big perforation and you see there is a lot of stool and the hole is too big. This is surgical emergency and there is no possibility to do endoscopic closure. But we have learned that if you have smaller orifices, smaller holes that are due to accident as you see here, or if they are due to like resection, this is the target sign. It's called the wannabe perforation because it's not a full perforation now, but soon it will be. Or if you are perforating during the procedure. So these lesions can be nicely closed while you are doing your colonoscopy. But look at this. This is Mayo Clinic USA. A quarter million colonoscopies, 2008, 2010. 180 perforations occurred at a time 
And 10 years ago, only one endoscopic attempt was done to close it. So during the 10 last years, during the past decade, major advances have happened and we have learned so much. And now we would send most of these patients to endoscopic closure. We will not send most of those to surgery. So this is what we have learned and what you will learn today. So what are the causes of perforation during colonoscopy? Well, there are several ones. There is direct trauma, like the second case I showed you, or there is electrocautery, like the first video I showed you, there is barotrauma, etc. So we need to know that there is diagnostic perforations due to technique or difficult colons and therapeutic perforations that can be up to 10%. But we need to be respectful of perforations, but not scared because we know how to tackle them. So every endoscopist will eventually face a iatrogenic colon perforation. That's the first take home message. But now let's look at this, the concept of perforation as a complication. So if it's an unintended damage to the entire thickness of the GI luminal tract, it's a complication. So as I showed you some examples before, but we are in a new era. We are in an era that we are like little surgeons. We also want to have the oncologist satisfied. We want our zero resection. So there is intended damage to the colon. So sometimes we do a full hole, but this is not a complication. This is ex exactly what we want to do, but we need to be ready to close it. And these concepts we wrote about a couple of five years ago in this uh, reviews, if you would like to uh, read them or also, Arthur Schmidt from Freiburg and Dr. Chacha wrote about this concept as well. So the second take home message is that advanced endoscopic resection techniques will result in unintended and intended colon perforations. When we're doing colonoscopy, the main factor is to have a clean colon because if something happens, you are able to do closure and avoid peritonitis. Clean colon, good prep is essential for every therapeutic procedure. This is the third take home message. The fourth take home message comes here. So we need to have good technique. The colon needs to be clean. We need to avoid pushing the fixed colon. We prefer always use CO2 now for colonoscopies, either diagnostic or therapeutic, and we lose a lot of water underwater colonoscopy, water-assisted colonoscopy. We like colonoscopes where you can flush. We flush permanently. We really love water because you can also do underwater resections. And preventatively, we love to use submucosal cushion, as you will see. So we baptize this concept as interventional chromendoscopy, but that's just a name given. So the concept is that if you do intervention with colors, you can demarcate the lesion when you inject, you can nicely see that when you inject, there is a lesion here, but not on the outside, but you can also demarcate the muscle in the deeper layer. So you have increased safety when you are doing interventional chromoendoscopy. And here you see how this polyp that was difficult to see was made clearly visible with interventional chromoendoscopy and how it could be resected afterwards. So the four take home message is, please use all possible maneuvers and measures to prevent unintended perforation. So when you're doing a colonoscopy, go one step ahead and that means prevention, prevention and prevention. But it will happen. Colon perforation will be happen and you need to be prepared. So therefore you need to be always suspicious no paranoid, but suspicious. You need to anticipate. So if you anticipate, you don't have it, but sometimes even you have, if you anticipate, it can happen. And then one needs to be very fast at detecting. You need to have early detection skills. So what's that? Well, always inspect the resection site. And if you see something, don't deny it. The first human reaction is to say, okay, it's nothing. That target sign, I saw it on this presentation, but my target sign doesn't look too bad. No, no, the target sign is there and it's better to see a target sign that is not there and then you close it with clips because that's so easy to do. 
This is one example of a target sign that uh, there was a discussion in our room. Nobody wanted to see it, but now you see it clearly. So there was no question, no problem. We need to close it, but soon, one minute while the nurse was getting the clips ready, just by insufflating a little CO2, you saw that here there is already a perforation of the target sign, but it was effectively closed with several clips. And I brought this picture to you because one, two, three, four clips, maybe two would have been enough. But my message to you is always use one more clip than you think you need to. So the fifth take home message is learn how to recognize an impending perforation and avoid denial. But now we go to the closures. What's your approach to colon perforation? Well, you see, everybody wants to start closing, but we need to start doing something first. Antibiotics. We always keep antibiotics in our room. We have cefotitan or ceftriaxone. We like cefotitan or ceftriaxone with metronidazole because bacteroid is fragile. It's, it's a microorganism that lives below the diaphragm in the colon. So we give this a mixture, but there is also unacid, for example, that you can use or piperacillin tazobactam. Key fact is use antibiotics on one side while the clip is being prepared. But if there is tension peritoneum, if the perforation was a little bigger, use an angel cut to decompress the abdomen because it can be catastrophic. The air inside of the abdomen can compress the portal vein, the cava, the return of blood, and then there will be shock. So use an angel cut. So intravenous antibiotics, angel cut, and then do the closure. On the other side, on your other ear, you need to have the phone to have surgical consultation, but don't panic because the surgeon will know that you are expert closing. So he will say, no problem, I will come. I know you can close these holes, but thank you for calling me because today it's Friday and tomorrow would be Saturday. And if that would be bad if he's called on the next day. And it's always important to be honest with the family and the patient, tell them the truth. And essentially, it's nothing better to be able to say, look, I made a hole, but I closed it. So then they will say, okay, thank you, no problem. But even if you were not able to close, it's important that they know you're doing all the best and quick messaging, like initially and not waiting too long. And then very important because you need to be proactive. Don't negate or procrastinate. We are humans, and this is the first thing we want to do. Okay, there is a little pain after the procedure. Uh, let's do the next colonoscopy and then see the patient again. No, just stay on this patient or have your fellow or resident or partner. Somebody needs to stay at bedside and look at this patient. And it's better to have a negative CT scan of a patient in the recovery room than to have them go home and come back with an exploded colon or it's better to observe them in the hospital. So this is a proactive way uh, that you need to act. So the sixth take home message is if perforation happened, act quickly, don't procrastinate and don't negate. Now we go to the final part, but the very hot topic. And now we will discuss some very interesting things. Through the scope clips is my main tool, number one, two, and three. So maybe you get frustrated to see that the scope clips are the main thing, but you will be happy to know that this is your main thing and you can apply them very nicely. But the over the scope clips are also fantastic. So this is our two main tools, including using CAT. But I'll expand on using the endo loop. Requi requires a little more skill, but it's also useful. Banding is okay for smaller perforations, just to close it quickly while you get some clips. You create a pseudo polyp and then you, you band the clip, the base of the banding size. Essentially in perforations that happen later, you can use all of these aspects. You can use glue, you can use polyglycolic acid sheets. I have used oxidized cellulose. Rarely using Apollo endo stitch in a perforation will be useful because it's a very big uh, apparatus. But if the perforation was in the rectum or rectal sigmoid, it's actually excellent to close it. And down the line, of course, you can use sponges. But let me show you some uh, slides. So he, here you see a small perforation. 
And this was seen immediately and actually closed immediately in two clips were essentially sufficient. Here, there was a scarred lesion that was being resected, you see here. And unfortunately, during resection and also viral trauma, because this was a cecum, a hole ensued. So three clips were necessary to close this uh, high-grade adenoma lesion that had been re partially resected elsewhere. Unfortunately, no full resection happens, but the patient did fine. The other aspect is be prophylactic. For example, this lesion, the ascending colon, was in a patient who was taking anticoagulants and the patient was elderly. Another risk factor would be what if this patient is using steroids or the patient uses oxygen at home that has COPD or if his surgical status is high. So take please all these considerations of, or if there is stool contamination because some studies will tell you, well, clips don't prevent uh, bleeding or clips might not prevent perforation. Well, this is big studies, but I live in a like a era of common sense more now than ever. And I like to focus on my patient. I do something, I do a personalized endoscopy. So the studies will help me in the guidelines, but I'm seeing a big defect right now. And this patient was taking steroids and has COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and uses oxygen at home. I'm not going to leave this lesion open in the right colon, and I prefer to close it with clips. And this is my advice to you. Always do personalized endoscopy and also lesionalized. How does your lesion, how does the wound look like? Does it tell you that it wants to be closed? Then close it. When you are up applying clips, because this is our main tool, I like to use a cap as well. I will show you this video again, but look at this cap. This is very nice to keep the target, keep the lesion in view, but also when you are using the cap, you are able to move folds away. And when you're using the cap, the clip will be open and then you pull it inside of the cap and the nurse does not need to close it because the cap will close the clip for you. So you are the one opening and closing the clip by pulling it back to you. So here I show you the video again. Look, the clip is open and now you push it out targeting the lesion. And when you go out, the clip opens automatically. But the beauty is that you start suctioning right now. It's in a nice position. And by suctioning, you target and you grasp more tissue inside the clip and you close. And there is another aspect I want you to see on this closure. You do not need to grasp mucosa to close a lesion. Remember the target sign, the target sign is in the middle. So you need to put the fibers, you need to put fibers, create a reaction for fibrosis and approximating enough muscle is good to close a perforation or to close the lesion. Unless it's a very big one, like you will see now. But now I want to show you some extended clip lesions or clip methods. Here you have a clip with some little nylon loop that is used for the teeth, like for the orthodontist, you can create your own, uh, I like to fish myself, I have a lot of nylon at home, but you can do little uh, like nylon loops and then use them to approximate a deletion. But here is another trick I have used. Let's say you have a lesion and you think you will need to be putting clips at the end. Well. Before you cut the lesion, you start doing incisions around it before you resect and cut the lesion. So you have enough of this incision so you can hook the clip on an incision and then go and target the other place and close your lesion perfectly by the hooking method. Or here you can use the loop and clip method. So you play some clip with the loop and then you end up closing the loop. That's another a trick to have handy if you are working. And finally, I want to focus on over the scope clips, which I really like to use. Here you see some examples here of this larger perforation, but there was stool contamination. So when you're using the over the scope clip, you really can suction enough tissue into the cap 
and do a nice uh, closure. And here is another example where the entire muscle was resected and uh, over the scope clip was useful to close the lesion. But look at this other perforation. This perforation is probably like 20 millimeters big. Here, you need to use the twin grasper, grasping one side first and then grasping the other side. And then you actually just pull the tissue inside. You don't suction, you pull the tissue. Look here, there is some perforation as well. And here, but you're grasping the tissue, but making sure that your cap around, look at the big perforation, the cap around is engulfing and having a limit of one or two millimeters because the teeth of the clip will come and really grasp it nicely here. So you see, perfectly uh, closed. And finally, look, this is the peritoneum going with a colonoscope, big perforation. In the past, of course, this was a surgical emergency, but with the advent of this over the scope clip and the twin grasper, you see here is the twin grasper. You have one arm and the other arm is here. You grasp one side first, always taking your time. This patient already has an angiocat. He does not have tension pneumoperitoneum. He already received the antibiotics. The surgeon is already in the room, but he doesn't want to operate. He wants you to do the closure. So one arm, very careful. You pull the tissue, very careful. You move the endoscope and now open the other arm of the twin grasper. And here, grasp the other part, just here. It's really definitely important to grasp the epithelium, the border. But just grasping a few millimeters is enough because you gently will pull all of the grasp part into your cap, as you will see here, and down suction. This is just gentle pulling technique. And here, the entire perforation was closed. This is the angel cat I was mentioning to you before. So the seventh take home message is that there are lots of tools and techniques available to close your colon perforations. As you saw, the clips are really the best. You have extended method with clips. You have the loop and clip technique. And of course, the over uh, the scope clip technique that can close lots of perforation. The conclusions are you will eventually have to deal with the colon perforation. There is a new concept of perforation during resection because you might want to do a full thickness resection, which is the perforations, but it's not a complication. It's essential that you have a clean colon before you do any therapeutics or before you close. And it's important that you anticipate, be prepared, avoid denial and act quickly. There are lots of tools and techniques available for endoscopic closure, but clips and uh, as through the scope and over the scope with extended methods remain standard. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Klaus. Um, we, are, we are a little late, so we will be brief, sorry, huh, about concerning discussion. I think we with, with the concept of personalized endoscopy, okay? This is, a, okay, but we will not discuss this point now. I think we should follow the rules. Okay, but I don't want to discuss this. Three very, three very short questions and three short answers, please. Do you always ask uh, uh, your surgeon an advice? When you are perforation, you always ask an, uh, an advice from a surgeon? I always call the surgeon. If the perforation is bigger, I call him faster. If it's a smaller, I call him okay. slower. Okay. But the surgeon always knows that I call him. And 95% of the times, he doesn't do anything. OK, OK. Uh, I still observe that we, are, we still have 5,660 uh, uh, attending the session. Short question. You have a perforation. You still have some adenoma aside the perforation, OK? What do you do? Yes. If you have a nice scope position, if you know that uh, the clips will come out of the scope and then close the perforation, I finish taking the adenoma, and then I close the perforation. 
I think so. I think this is the best option. Yeah. Now, uh, last question. And this, this webinar is organized thanks to Ipsum, okay? So we, we, I, I want to conclude by, by preparation. Importantly, you have a perforation and, and, and the, the colon is badly prepared. You should avoid stools to pass through the perforation. Do you, do you turn the patient? Do you change the position? How do you manage this situation? Yes, uh, we turn and we try to uh, clean, avoiding that it spills into the peritoneum and do a quick closure. If I understood you right, that's my- Okay, answer. no, no, that, that means that the problem, I'm, I'm always frightened by the, the stools of the residues passing through the perforation into the peritoneum. How do, do you avoid this? Ah, okay. If the perforation is big and there is stools in the peritoneum, there is really no more way to avoid. And then this is definitely a case for laparoscopy, laparotomy. Okay. So my personal view is that um, this is my, I'm frightened by stools passing through a perforation. So I try to clean at the maximum before taking care of a perforation. Sometimes I turn the patient to be sure that the stools are not passing through the perforation side. So thank you, Klaus. Okay. I will let Evgeny to conclude. Yes, my conclusion would be very short. First of all, difficult cases in colonoscopy and subsequent adverse events and complications are waiting for every one of us around the corner. And I remember on the first uh, European meeting of complications in GI endoscopy, the wise words of Hans Dieter Alescher that an endoscopy unit without complications is either not working or not honest. That's why we have to work with our complications and our adverse events and difficult cases, of course, to manage and avoid them, but mainly to learn from them. And uh, today, uh, our meeting, our presentations, thank you very much for everyone, for audience, for um, our colleagues, who really explain to us what should we perform, what should we do in difficult case. Thank you so much and uh, see you in the future. Okay, okay. Uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. Wow. Thank you all. Bye-bye.